Now it's my great honor to introduce our speakers, Henry Louis Gates, Jr., Alphonse Fletcher, University Professor and Director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, and Dr. Lonnie Bunch, the 14th Sec Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, the world's largest museum complex. Now, Professor Gates and Dr. Bunch have many things in common. They have both enjoyed working in spaces designed by David Adjaye, both are institution builders with a broad public mission to advance the study and appreciation of African American history. Both are passionate collectors and curators of historical objects. Both are intellectual descendants of W.E.B. Du Bois and are keen to connect his legacy to the work of our time. And both have tackled the epic challenge of telling the whole story of African American history. Professor Gates in his Emmy Award PBS series, Many Rivers to Cross, and of course, Secretary Bunch as the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. To say just a little more about both of these extraordinary individuals, Professor Gates is an Emmy Award winning filmmaker, literary scholar, journalist, cultural critic, and institution builder who has authored or co-authored 24 books and created 20 documentary films, including Finding Your Roots, his groundbreaking genealogy series, now in its fifth season on PBS. His latest project is the history series Reconstruction, America After the Civil War, released earlier this year on PBS. He has also published two related books, Dark Sky Rising, Reconstruction and the Dawn of Jim Crow with Tonya Bolden and Stony the Road, Reconstruction, White Supremacy and the Rise of Jim Crow. Dr. Bunch is one of the nation's leading figures in the historical and museum community and the first African American to lead the Smithsonian Institution. And just yesterday, he is also one of the 2019 recipients of the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal. This medal is awarded by Harvard's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, and it is an honor bestowed on those individuals who have made significant contributions to African and African American history and culture. Dr. Bunch's accomplishments are many, and I could spend the whole evening um, sharing them, but instead, we have a wonderful video which tells his story, um, and we are gonna show it now. Creating this museum gives us a chance to make manifest the dreams of many generations. We call the lost dream back. This is a milestone moment, not only for the Smithsonian, but for the United States. The goal of the museum is to make America better provide opportunities for us to be made better by the past and for us to move towards a future where race will always matter. They will find that those ideals are only met through sacrifice and struggle and a belief in a better day. place is more than a building, it is a dream come true. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. And by knowing this other story, we better understand ourselves and each other. I too am American. I do want to give a shout out to Lonnie. It's really important to understand this project would not and could not have happened without his drive, his energy, and his optimism. 11 years we have dreamed, prayed, toiled for this day. Today, a dream too long deferred is a dream no longer. 
We've guaranteed that as long as there's an America, this museum will educate, engage, and ensure a fuller story of our country will be told on the National Mall. Welcome home. In May, the Smithsonian named its newest secretary, Lonnie Bunch III. What I hope is that I can help the whole Smithsonian be the place that people look to, not just to visit, but for answers to help them live their lives. So for me, it's about helping the Smithsonian be the place that is the glue for America and that helps America grapple with who it is, help us understand itself and its world. Join me in welcoming Professor Henry Lewis Gates, Jr. and Secretary Lonnie G. Bunch. Thank you, Jane. Give it up for Lonnie Bunch the third, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Oprah said, you're my friend, you're my friend. <laughs> Chicago Mayor Richard Daly, you all remember the good old days, Richard Daly? He actually questioned your decision to move, quote unquote, to a one horse company town like Washington, D.C. <laughs> what did you say when uh, Mayor Daly said that to you, my brother? I said, thank you, Mr. Mayor, I'm still going. And, uh, <laughs> What was the most difficult thing about leaving a remarkably successful tenure at the Chicago Historical Society to take on what Daly called a project? I mean, I think that was really the biggest challenge, is that for 100 years, people had tried to build this museum. And my notion was, well, could I do it? So why would I leave Chicago where I had fooled people? I had raised $26 million. They thought I knew what I was doing. So I thought, why leave? But I realized that. Being an African-American running the Chicago Historical Society nurtured my soul, but I realized that if we could build the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, it would nurture the soul of my ancestors, and there was no choice. Were, were you hesitant at all? Terrified. We <laughs> <laughs> okay, how many of your fears became realities once you moved, once you embarked on what? Some people call a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I was lucky because I was really concerned about moving back to Washington. You've got to understand, I was at the Smithsonian for many years. And when I left the Smithsonian, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done. And I had to convince myself that I'd never go back. Otherwise, you'd sort of just, you know, be miserable. So when they called me to come back, I remember thinking, I'm not good enough. Um, I've got to raise, you know, half a billion dollars. Half a billion uh, dollars. Um, and I've got to figure out how to get a staff and get this going. So, to be honest, none of my fears came true. What was your worst or most ridiculous, ridiculous fundraising trip? The worst, not okay. the best. I know two of the best, but I'm going to ask you about that. But as a fundraiser myself, I want to know when you go, Damn, I can't believe that just happened. <laughs> so we had had, I've got amazing people on the council of the museum, such as Ann Fudge, um, and many of them opened doors for us. And so there was a, a company that said, um, they talked to one of the council members and said, we're interested, why don't you come up and meet with us? So, but we couldn't get anything scheduled and finally get scheduled. And I have to get up really early, get that 5 a.m. train. Um, and I'm with a colleague and we walk into the building and they ignore us. We're just sitting there for about an hour, hour and a half. And then somebody comes out calling a name that's not mine. And it turned out it was the person we were gonna meet, but it wasn't the person I had scheduled to meet. So this woman comes out, greets us, but doesn't say hello or anything. And she just walks us back into this conference room, no offer of coffee, anything. So we're waiting another 40 minutes and somebody comes in and he says, 
you know, I was told that um, I was to meet with you and I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk, but you know what? Never mind. We're not interested at all in what you've, what you've got to sell, so um, goodbye. Oh, no, and man. so the worst part, though, was when we were walking out, the woman who had walked us in is laughing at us. She's covering her mouth, oh, giggling. Man. That was the very worst. If that had happened early in the tenure of this project, I would have felt what a failure I was. Um, but we really felt that was the that was the very worst of anything that happened. And has that company called you to get uh, free tickets? Uh, on... <laughs> you know, they still haven't given us a dime. No, really? Not a dime. Lonnie, you and I have known each other a long time. We have a we're very close friends. Um, so a couple things I've never asked you. One is, what do you think in your background prepared you for this role? I mean, you've gone from writing about history to making history. Oh, jeez. You have, and you've made history in, in, in two ways. The National African American Museum, of course, and then becoming the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian. Either one would have, would have been enough. But what do you think for real um, brought you to the table? I mean, I think that for a lot of us, it was our parents. You know, my parents were two teachers, and their notion was how central education was to your future, but also the notion that nothing should stand in your way. I grew up in a town where, in our, my part of town, we were the only black family. And so it was an Italian town, so I still curse in Sicilian. Um, <laughs> and what, what I learned there was how to fight, how to run, and how to talk my way out of things. And I think that served me in good stead the rest of my career. <laughs> And you, you can talk your way out of things in Italian and in English. That's right, right. absolutely. <laughs> the, uh, but was that, so you went to the white school, as yeah. we would call it yeah. back in the day, yeah. as they had those. Yeah, the most amazing thing to me was, so I am, you know, long gone from the neighborhood, and I did something on the radio in L.A., and this woman calls and says, um, do you know who I, who I am? I was your girlfriend in kindergarten. Um, <laughs> Because she said that, remember that in that town, they wouldn't let the black kid dance with white girls, right. but you could dance with the Jewish girl, ah. right? And, and she said her name was Esther, and I'm like, I remember it like it was yesterday, but I don't know Esther. It turned out it was my dad, because I'm Lonnie the Third. That this Esther was his dance partner in the 30s. <laughs> so I called my dad and he said, oh, Esther Shapiro. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then his dad said, did she leave her number? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did, too. <laughs> did you, um, did it, people give you a hard time? I mean, you're the black kid in the class, right? Yeah. I mean, is this a Richard Wright story where, you know, you go to the teacher in the eighth grade and you say you want to be a lawyer, and they go, no, your right. people meant to be carpenters? That's exactly what they said. Um, they told me that I should work in a print shop. No. That was the best I could be. And what I remember more than anything else, you know, every year you would, they'd go into school and they'd ask what your parents did. Right. And my parents were teachers. I'd said one worked at the Board of Education in this town, one worked at the other town, and they would always say, oh, it must be nice to have janitors who have a steady job. Oh, no. Yep. And so I remember for years I never said anything to my father. When I finally said something, he and my mother came up. Oh, it was, it was just bloody. Oh, I bet. Really <laughs> um, but I was very proud. Well, you, you do work in a print shop. You own a print shop. It's called the Smithsonian Institution Publishing Company. Right. <laughs> what do you think were your greatest successes regarding, I love this phrase you use, quote, making the in invisible and forgotten central to our understanding. What do you think, um, well, your short list of successes in doing that. Because what we're trying to do is change the narrative. Absolutely. We're trying, um, Brian Stevenson, who's mm -hmm. along with John oh, Wilson, right. the closest mm -hmm. person to a saint, I think, that I've ever met. Yeah, that's true. Gave an interview in Vox Magazine in, um, two years ago. And in it, he said, the worst thing about the Civil War and Reconstruction, as bad as slavery was and uh, Jim Crow, following the rollback to Reconstruction, was the narrative that they created, the United Daughters of the Confederacy and a lot of other people, the Columbia School, as you so well know. And that we've been tortured by this narrative since at least the 1890s. So what those of us who are professors of African-American African studies, 
uh, which Lani is, an institution builder, which you are, and a museum director, which you are the par excellence. In various ways, we are trying to change the narrative. How exactly. successful are we at doing that? And what have been the high points in your career um, well, at doing that? Well, I think first of all, Skip, you've done so much of that. You've really both changed the narrative and part of changing the narrative is embracing so much more than African-American history so people understand that that's central to who we are regardless of race. And for me, part of it was working in museums to sort of change the, change the, the pace of museums. Um, one of the things I was proudest of was I collected the Greensboro Lunch Counter from the 1960s, and I was the associate director of the Museum of American History, and when I collected it, um, the other curator said, well, one day we'll do an exhibition on the 20th century, so let's put it in storage. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, I'm in charge. So <laughs> I decided the best thing I could do, in those days the Smithsonian had the Star Spangled Banner, the flag hanging up, so I said, let's put the Greensboro lunch counter next to that. Right. Let's begin to change the way people look at America. And I think those kinds of things were crucially important. But I think the best thing was really taking the African American Museum and saying, this is understanding America through an African American lens. To suddenly say, this is the quintessential story of us all. That, I think, changed things dramatically. Why do you think uh, there are lines still you know, around the block trying to get in them. How old is the museum? It's three years. Three, and there's still lines around the block. Why? Because the staff was so brilliant that what, what, what we realized is there was a thirst for the unvarnished truth. It was also done in a way that was engaging, um, that wasn't about guilt or pointing fingers. It was about understanding. Um, but I am stunned at how many people still want to get in. I mean, the other day, a woman called said she wanted tickets. I said, no, I don't do tickets. Right. And she said, literally, she was my girlfriend in seventh grade. Oh, wow. right. Now- Was she Italian? Yeah, Italian. yeah, Italian. Well, you know. So I'm sitting there listening to the name and I don't know her at all. But being from Jersey, you take your shot. It was a good lie, I gave her tickets. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. But I think it is, I think part of it is it's become a pilgrimage site. It's become a place for many generations to go understand not only their own history, but how they were shaped by prior history. And I think that if you look at, you know, the museum, we've got one of the highest percentage of senior citizens of any Smithsonian Museum. Wow. And you really see this intergenerational sharing over and over and over again. Um, and I think that's part of the appeal, is that people feel comfortable to be able to explore things that are often uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that was really a conscious decision in the museum. How, um, <clears throat> let me see how I can ask this question analogous to m my own experience. Mm -hmm. The um, American National Biography, for those of you who don't know, that's the official um, biographical dictionary right. of Americans. And it's, I don't know, 30 volumes right. or something, published by Oxford University Press. So I may get the numbers, but 10 or 15 years ago, they wrote to me, I'm an Oxford author, and they asked me if I would um, look at their table contents and see what black people have been left up. So, you know, the thing is 30 volumes, right? So, you, you can't, so I just randomly started looking for people. You know, I'm sitting around thinking, well, who do I admire? Um, how about James McCune Smith, right. Frederick Douglass' best friend, the best educated black man in America, three degrees from the University of Glasgow, medical doctor, and he wrote for Douglas's newspaper, and then he had a kind of postmodern sensibility. Uh, no James McCune Smith. And I look for other people, and then they're not there. You know, George Washington Carver's there, Booker T. Washington's there, Du Bois is there, but a lot of the people whom we would expect to be there weren't there. So I wrote to them, and I said, uh, nobody's in here, really. I mean, <laughs> uh, why don't you let me organize a project doing the African American National Biography? Mm -hmm. And they did. And we did the same thing with the W.W. Norton Company. The Norton Anthology of American Literature was full of holes. Mm -hmm. So we did the Norton Anthology of African American Literature. And there have been good hearted people who come up to me to say, um, 
It's one thing to do a black anthology, right. right? It's one thing to do a black biographical dictionary. But how do you integrate, right. how do you get James McCune Smith into the American National Biography? How do you get Phyllis Wheatley mm -hmm. into the Norton Anthology of American Literature? So how do you reconcile this tension? Uh, how do you answer this question, which is posed to me, about the relationship between building a canon of knowledge about the African-American experience and changing the larger narrative of the American experience? After all, exhibits can't just leap out of the national, the IJ Genius Building and go into uh, the Museum of Natural History. Right. So, well, I think, I think you do it on several levels. First of all, within the museum, you actually identify areas where the African-American experience explicitly changed the American experience. So that therefore, whether it is simply looking at the wonderful work you did on Reconstruction, how so much of public education in the South comes because black people get educated and demand it. Right. Um, and and that, they were black legislatures. Absolutely, right. and that, that changes everything, right? right? Um, and then the other thing is museums love models and messiahs, and right now, the African American Museum is the model and the messiah. Oh, so great. therefore, all these other institutions are now grappling with how do they reach diverse audiences? How do they tell stories in different ways? How do they use technology? So part of it is, I argue, by showing that you could make the best museum in the world based on a subject that many people were afraid of, it's going to change the way the rest of the museums do their work. Now, the Boston Globe reporters in the audience, that is your, your uh, inset <laughs> quote. Museums love, say it again. Uh, models and messiahs. Models and messiahs. Messiahs, you can write that down. <laughs> that is, that is a, a brilliant observation. So that you change the paradigm. Yep. And you make it sexy. You show yep. that it has market value. You show that you suddenly can get lines around the building. Yeah. That you can create a restaurant that people want to actually eat the food, um, <laughs> that you can really sell books about history that people will buy, right. and suddenly everything changes. What was the toughest challenge you faced in the construction of the, of the museum on the mall? And the obvious follow-up that everyone wants to know is, did you ever feel like giving up? Well, the toughest was where I made what was, could have been the worst mistake of my career. If you've been in the museum, that you notice that when you go down to the history galleries, they're tiered. You walk up and you go basically through three floors. Mm -hmm. Well, the original plan was to have just one floor of galleries. Oh. And as we talked with designers and others, I said, well, why don't we, you know, let's go ahead and do three floors. The problem is that meant we had to go down 80 feet. Right. We hit water at eight feet. Oh, man. Um, and we had so much water that it just filled up and they couldn't figure out how to get rid of the water. And literally, I thought the project was dead. Oh, I man. thought that basically I would be known as the guy who built the largest swimming pool on the National Mall. <laughs> um, and oh, that's horrible, it was, man. it was really bad. That's bad. And at one point, it was so bad that they called in all these engineers and nobody knew how to do it. So one day I was talking to folks and I said, you know, who are the best people to deal with water? The Dutch. So we called engineers from the Netherlands. No I figured, kidding. oh, absolutely. Um, and they came in and figured out how to get rid of the water. Wow. Uh, you, know. you got to give it up to Donnie <laughs> Bush for that. No, that is brilliant. Because I really thought I had screwed up. I really no, thought that was brilliant. the worst. You know? Did you tell anybody? Did you tell Oprah to take her $20 million back? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's the key, right? I already spent it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. How you doing, Lonnie? Oh, That's everything's good. fine. Right. Everything's fine. Well, isn't that your job, right? You know, but Why I, are you spending so much time in Amsterdam? Right. Oh, I like them. <laughs> I like right. Indonesian food. That's right, exactly. <laughs> oh, no. But, but I think, you know, <laughs> that was great. the time I despaired, right? I really <laughs> yeah. thought that it wouldn't work. But other than that, I mean, I really thought that once we actually got land on the mall, I knew we'd pull it off. Yeah. Because the real key was, where were we going to get the land on the mall? Right. Um, and, you know, because the government normally tells the Smithsonian, put a building here. Right. Well, they didn't want to do that. Now... When I'm being kind, it's because it was the last space on the mall. When I'm being truthful, it's because it was something African-American. And there was this <laughs> desire not to have this on the mall. And so there were sites that I still can't find. They were, I don't know where they are. They were so far away from the mall. Um, <laughs> and so, but once we were able to convince the regents that this was the place for the museum, because the museum's council just knew there's no other choice, once we got that, 
that was when I knew we'd be successful. Right. But I have to be honest, I actually prepared when we were trying to figure out how this was, decision was going to be made, I actually hired people from the Clinton administration who were crisis management people huh. and said, okay, if I don't get this the way I want, what do I do? Oh, and, they, and they told me to walk away. So oh, I really had two speeches prepared because I didn't know how it was going to go. I had the one speech, oh, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. And the other speech was, I cannot be there where you disrespect the African-American community. Right. So I remember not telling anybody I had that speech. And my wife found it and said, wait a minute. You mean someone's going to be out of a job? <laughs> uh, so luckily they picked the right spot. Oh, that, but where did you get this? Um, people ask me, you know, okay, what do you think has contributed to the successes that you've had. And to me, it's knowing how to and learning how to ask for advice. Yep. And you have that same mm -hmm. capacity. And, and, and some people think, and I tell this to our students, that's a sign of weakness right. to say, I don't know and I need your help. John Blum was my great oh, mentor yeah. at Yale, mm -hmm. John Morton Blum, the, Amer the American historian. And he said, it's an act of empowerment. When you ask someone for their advice, they think you're a genius mm -hmm. because you ask them, for, right. right? And if you and want he told them to, me that when I was a junior at Yale, and if they want, if you want them to give you money, yeah, go oh, to yeah. them and say, please, I need your advice. How do we do Listen, this? Here's a here, here's a chiasmus. If you ask somebody for money, they'll give you advice. Right. If you ask them for right. advice, they'll give, give you, you money. money. That's right. Never That's forget it. that. That's Never right. forget that. I'm always asking for advice. Yeah, you, you know. Uh, me too. You can't get loaned from a bank when your checks are bouncing. That's you know, right. like, <laughs> That's right. um, but so where did you learn that? You know, I, I mean, think you went to the Clinton yeah. team for crisis management. You, you, you know, somehow, um, Peter, who's the, who, who's the little boy who put his finger in the dike? The dike, yeah, the, I don't know, the, I don't know, the little Dutch boy. I don't the know little Dutch, you yeah. ought to give everybody a free copy of that book. Cause that. <laughs> you know, I think for me, it was really understanding African American history. Mm -hmm. That you realize that, for me, it was a phrase was, you make a way out of no way. Mm -hmm. And African American history taught me that there are ways to not give up, there are ways to work a system, there are ways to figure out when to confront, when to let somebody else carry the idea. Right. So for me, every time I struggled, I'd read something about Harriet Tubman, or I'd read something about the sort of creation of the NAACP in the early 20th century, or I'd read something you wrote. And that would really give me the sort of reservoir that I can dip into mm -hmm. to figure out how we move forward. But what the you... other thing was, quite candidly, is I hate to admit this, but I am so damn competitive. I hate to lose on anything. Oh, me too. I hate you it. know, yeah. so part of it was, how do I win? Right. I mean, that's why I literally would sit up and say, okay, how do I win this moment? Oh, that's and good. that's the way I would do it. No, that's good. That's what you have to do. Let me ask you something I've never asked you before. And something another interview you won't, won't ask. You have to be an African-American and interested in history to ask this question. If you could go back in the time machine mm -hmm. to one period or to meet one historical person, who would it be? Du Bois. Du Bois? I mean, there's no, there's, I mean, you know, he, as I said last night, he's the gold standard. Yeah. Um, the ability to sort of be a gifted historian, to use that history, to be a social activist, to be as brilliant as he was, to recognize that what he did was write history for today and tomorrow, not just yesterday, mm -hmm. that would be the person I'd want to meet. Is there a particular period, um, not may maybe that you wouldn't like to have lived in. Is there a period you would have liked to have lived in? Would or would not have? Would you, yeah, would, would have. You know, because I'm not picking cotton. No, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's just not happening. Uh, hey, you know. I'm with you on that. No, <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Mississippi, Alabama, 1849. Not me. No, okay, no, no. <laughs> that, that time machine. <laughs> no, no. Let's don't stop it. Yeah, no, let's, <laughs> let's get a little closer. Yeah, you know? that's right. No, I mean, I think that, you know, for a lot of us, you'd want to live in the 1920s. You know, you'd like to sort of see the benefit of this migration of people from the South to the North, to see the kind of both tension but amazing change of tint and tone yeah. of America's cities. Yeah. That would have been interesting to be at. I agree. That was the first period of African-American history that I really studied, yeah. the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason is I went to Yale in 69. Black studies were just being invented. Mm -hmm. There weren't even that many sources available and not that many people to teach 
those sources. So they concentrated on slavery and refuting Stanley Elkin's Sambo theory that black people had been reduced to Sambos by the, the um, owner's oppression of slavery. But the other one was the Harlem Renaissance as a mirror of the black arts movement. Right. And so there were these two, I think I studied the Harlem Renaissance three times over in two years, you know. But it was the jazz age and yep. the birth of modernism mm -hmm. and the birth of, of literally, the, the metaphorically the jazz age, but literally the birth of this America's greatest musical form. Right. And the notion of issues of gender are so strong. Oh, yeah. You know, watching these black women carve out careers, sort of make this transition from an urban setting, from a rural setting to an urban setting, that to me was so fascinating. Me too. And the fact that, I mean, it took me years. It's kind of like learning the, about the complex sexuality of the, the Greeks, yeah. um, but which nobody ever talked about, right? Not, <laughs> not when I was growing up, not in my school, but learning about how many of the black um, um, authors of the Harlem Renaissance were gay or bisexual, right, right. which wasn't in the no, initial. No. So identity was fluid and quite complex and also torturous. Right. I mean, I think in a way, one of the challenges of building a national museum was how do you tell those stories? Mm -hmm. How do you make sure issues of identity and sexuality are at the heart of the museum? And that was a real challenge because those are things the Smithsonian doesn't normally do. Right. Um, and because even though we are our own museum, we're part of the Smithsonian. Yeah. Um, and so it was really thinking very creatively about how do you tell the stories that have to be told? How do you raise the issues that often aren't raised in museums? And as John O. Franklin used to tell both of us, how do you tell the unvarnished truth? Right. Um, some of the best parts of your book, and I encourage you um, to buy Lonnie's brilliant book before you leave, because if you don't, you're not going to be able to leave. <laughs> we have locked. <laughs> we have locked all the doors, so <laughs> that's just the way it's going to be. Now, some and of I'm the, from Jersey, so we only take cash. Yeah, that's right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and he was telling me now that he's a government official or whatever the status is, you can't even give him a gift yeah. without it being. T tell him about that. So, I would say, Lonnie, I'm going. I was going to give you a first edition. <laughs> Of signed by a W. E. B. Du Bois of the Souls of Black Folk, which cost thirty thousand dollars. Oops, but I can't. So I <laughs> here's a photograph. You know. <laughs> but if you had said in private, you would have tempted me. You yeah, know? right. Um, no, it, it's the, the you know the rules of the secretary. There's certain things you can't take as gifts, and my favorite is so. It's a story, but so basically early on in the process when I started with a staff of two, um, we didn't have offices and they finally gave me offices in another building and when I went to the offices, they were locked. So I went down to the front desk and asked the, the manager, I said, uh, I'm the new director of the Smithsonian Museum, I'd like keys to my office. They said, we don't know who the hell you are, we're not letting you in. <laughs> So then I figure, okay, African-American, where are the African-Americans? So I got down to the guards, right? I figure the guards are black, so I go down to see the guards, <laughs> oh, um, and I said the same thing, and I never get this guy said to me, he said, we're not gonna let you in because you might steal something. <laughs> so I'm thinking it's an empty office, so I'm standing in front of it with my one staff, and a guy comes by with a maintenance truck, and on the truck is a crowbar. So I actually broke into our offices. That's how we started. And so, so then year, fast forward years later, I'm leaving the museum <laughs> and coming over to the secretary and one of my former colleagues sends over a crowbar. <laughs> the problem was the Smithsonian needed to evaluate it, take pictures, look at the value before they decide I could actually keep it. <laughs> so you know, if I could barely keep a crowbar, I can't keep the boys at all. No. Well, you broke into uh, your office and uh... Some people think I broke into my house, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and we do have the cuffs. I, mean, I do have the, the cuffs are in, I am an exhibit. That's right. And those handcuffs, um, which Officer Crowley generously gave me, I gave to Oprah, said you should give them to, to, yeah. me, to Lonnie, meaning the museum. Mm -hmm. And um, they, I'm there, and I'm there with, um, as part of the exhibition of black people in Martha's Vineyard. It's very kind of you to do that. I mean, that was a big thing. I mean, my kids really, like, wow, Daddy, you are somebody, you know. You know. 
<laughs> and I you must admit, know. I was worried when Oprah gave me handcuffs. I was like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so finally she explained it. I was okay then. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Oprah. Don't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, some of the best parts of your, vo your book, uh, to me as a scholar especially, involve your acquiring of a very special artifact, such as Nat Turner's Bible or, sadly, Emmett Till's casket. Um, what was your favorite discovery? The object, there are two objects that mean the world to me. Emmett Till's casket is really one of them, in part because when I was president of the Chicago Historic Society, I became close to Studs Terkel, the great oral historian. Oh, yeah. And Studs would bring people into my office. And one day he said, would you like to meet Emmett Till's mother? And I didn't know she was still alive. Wow. So he brought this Mamie, woman, right? Mamie Till, Mamie yeah. Till Mobley. Mm -hmm. He brought her into my office. She was so short, her feet couldn't touch the floor, right? Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, she's gonna, we're gonna spend an hour together. She spends seven hours telling me what happened from the time she kissed her son goodbye oh, wow. till the time he, she buried him, mm. right? And I was so moved by her, um, we became friends. And I started writing articles about her for the Tribune. Mm -hmm. And I was at her house on a Friday, and we were going to get together next week, the following week, and she died that Sunday. Oh. But the one thing she had said to me before she died is she said, for 50 years, she carried the burden of Emmett Till, and now it was my turn. And so I then left to run the Smith, to go back to the Museum of American History, uh, Amer African American History. Mm -hmm. And two years later, they find Emmett Till's casket. Because when Emmett Till was disinterred by the Justice Department, he was buried in a new casket. And he was, the old one was going to be sort of kept in this pristine state, but it was thrown in a shed. Raccoons were living in it. And the family called me and said, would you do something? And I remember thinking, is this too ghoulish? Should I do it? So I decided that I would preserve it. We built a special place so nobody could gawk at it and see it. Mm -hmm. But then when we were doing the exhibitions, I realized that the story wasn't Emmett, it was Mamie. Mm -hmm. It was the courage of this woman to take the, the most painful moment of her life and use that to reinvigorate the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So when I thought about that, I said, that's how we do it. Right. And so every time, Every morning, I always get to the museum early, and I always walk in and look at Emma Till's casket to sort of think of the sacrifice of that child, but also the courage of the mother. So that, to me, is the most sacred space in the museum. Oh, that's beautiful. You know? that's yeah. beautiful. And my second favorite artifact is something that's not even on display, that I spent years trying to find slave ships. Um, because oh, yeah. I really felt that most Americans didn't understand the international slave trade. And so, and I thought foolishly, how hard can that be, right? They had to be somewhere. Well, I didn't realize most of them were at the bottom of the ocean. Right. Right. You know? So we had to put together an international team to map the ocean floor, to try to find these wrecks. And we had found one that sank off the coast of Cuba. Mm -hmm. And I spent years negotiating with the Castros but they weren't going to let me dive because right. it turned out where he wanted to dive was an old submarine base or something. Oh, so yeah. that wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. But luckily, I knew people in South Africa who said they thought they had a ship um, that sank off the coast of Cape Town. Right. Would I bring expertise and scholars? And we did. And it turned out it was a ship, the Sao Jose, mm -hmm. that had left Lisbon in 1794, had gone all around to Mozambique and picked up 512 people from the Makua tribe. Mm -hmm. On its way back, it sank off the coast of Cape Town. Half of the, quote, cargo was lost, mm -hmm. and the other half was sold. I felt it was crucially important then to go talk to the Makua people in Mozambique. So I went to Mozambique and met with the chief of the Makua people, and he brought me a gift. He said, here is a vessel wrapped in cowrie shells. This is a gift for you. And I open it, and it's full of soil. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to figure out, OK, look, I, you know, what's, what kind of gift is this? And then he said, his ancestors have begged me to take this soil to the site of the wreck, sprinkle the soil over the site of the wreck so the first time since 1794 his people could sleep in their own land. Oh, wow. That, to me, was the most touching moment. I'm thinking, they're paying me? Oh, yeah. uh, you know, really pretty special. Now, I remember in press conference when that was announced, and you said, I wanted to give the American people a slave ship, and now we've been able to do it. Yeah. Most of us don't realize it, but 2%, um, 2%, 
of our enslaved ancestors who came to the United States exactly. came from Mozambique, and that was a long, That's right. a long middle passage because yeah. you had to go all the way around the bottom of the continent yep. and then you know cross then cross the ocean. Um, you pioneered the um, Save Our African American Treasures campaign, which is sort of um, African American Antiques Roadshow, right? Mm -hmm. um, where people can learn about historical artifacts and preservation. Why do you think it's been so effective? Well, partly because literally I fell asleep in front of the television and woke up and the Antique Roadshow was on. <laughs> I'd never heard of it. And I thought, what a good idea. So, you know, you just can't steal it. So you call it Saving African American Treasures. <laughs> um, um, but I think part of what, it, what happened really is early in my career, I was working in California, I was collecting in California, and I was told this woman had amazing collections. So I went to see her, and she's telling me she has nothing. You know, why are you here? You're wasting my time. And then to get rid of me, she said, well, go look in the garage, see if you can find anything. And it was a treasure trove, and I thought, I bet things are still in basements, trunks, and attics of people's homes. Sure. And it turned out that we would go around the country, we would do these programs, we'd say, bring out your stuff. We wouldn't take it. We'd help you preserve grandma's old shawl, that 19th century photograph. And then people would sort of call and say, I've got this and I've got that. So that the museum collected 40,000 artifacts of which 70% came out of basements, trunks, and attics of people's homes. And to me, that's the success of the museum. Yeah, do you get letters we get letters um, um, a lot from people who will have something which they think yeah. is going to pay for their the rest of their lives. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's not worth anything. Right. I mean, it's like the third edition of the 10th printing of the souls of black folks. Yep. And then you have to tell them and they go, you're just trying to steal it. That's exactly right. <laughs> you know, my favorite is that somebody called and said, they had a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. And they wanted to know how much it was worth. And I was like, right. you kidding? So I, they brought it in, because I figured, you know, hey, just in case. And it turned out it was one of those things that were made on fake parchment in the yeah. 50s, yeah. right? And it was hard to tell the poor woman. She was like, no, this is real. And I said, look at the bottom. It says 1957. Right. You yeah. know? Um, and she is still mad at me, because oh, yeah. she, you know. Um, no, because people have unreasonable expectations, and uh, they fantasize about it. But um, it's difficult. It, that is a very difficult thing. So what I say is, ask Lonnie Bunch, because I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. you got to get him to uh, give you advice. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, W. Now, I would, Lonnie was kind enough to invite me to the um, opening of the museum. And there weren't many academics. That were, I mean, you couldn't, the, the academics couldn't get through for members of the Congress and Black Wall Street and, you know, Look, entertainers. You had to give some money, and academics don't give money, okay? Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's be true, you know? <laughs> yeah, I just went. That's I just right. showed up. Well, Skip's always like, Lonnie, let me in. Fine. Yeah, that's right, you let know? me in, and he did. <laughs> um, but, the, among the speeches, the, one of the most moving, and it was quoted in, mm -hmm. um, I was we were listening to the wonderful video, was W. Mm -hmm. And it was heartfelt. Yep. Um, so how important was George W. Bush in making sure the museum was built? And secondly, did your working relationship change your opinion of him as a politician and as a person? Not as a politician, okay. but as a person. Because what really struck me is, George Bush, when everybody was saying in the Republican Party, this museum should not be on the mall, he actually stood up and said, it has to be on the mall. And so it helped me every time I went on the Hill, I would say, but the president says it needs to be there. Um, and then he really had been unbelievably supportive. You know, in order to get money, you got to get in the president's budget. He always made sure in the budget, if I needed things. I became close to his wife, Laura Bush, um, and Smart she, move, Lonnie. You know, hey, you know. <laughs> um, and I would give her books to read. And so, you know, she would, we'd read books together. And so she then introduced me to George, and he was really very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, his politics you can't live with, right. but, but the fact that he's a good guy, mm -hmm. um, I was really quite taken by that. And he is a good guy. He really is. Yeah, uh, uh, Condi is a very good friend of mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, she, I, we, I did... Um, you know, the, the film about Lincoln. Right. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask George W. Bush about Lincoln, but I wanted to go to Lincoln bedroom. And Condi 
arranged for George W. Bush to give me a tour of the Lincoln bedroom mm -hmm. and to be interviewed in the Lincoln bedroom. And he was really nice, he was smart, he was funny. I came back to Harvard and I go, George W. Bush, and they go, you've been drinking the Kool-Aid down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's wrong with you, boy? <laughs> no, but he, he is. He, yeah. and, he, and he had Condi, he had Colin yeah. Powell. Yeah. No, you no. Know. I was quite, he, he really was important in those early days. There's no doubt about that. How important is it that the secretary of the Smithsonian is an African-American? You know, I'm still struggling with this because I work for six secretaries and now I am one. Mm -hmm. It feels really weird. Um, wow, but, you worked for six. Yeah, you and know. And there have only been a total of 14. 14. You know, so I've been at Smithsonian a long time. Wow. But, um, or oh, they get fired quickly. I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, but I think that I recognize symbolically what it means. Um, the fact, the reaction around the world was overwhelming. Oh, yeah. Um, I received thousands of emails. And, you know, what I realized is being secretary of the Smithsonian opens all these other doors. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the only reason I've really wanted to have a career, mm -hmm. was to open doors for other people. Oh, that's and beautiful. So that's what the secretary of the Smithsonian does. Although I must admit, I'm wondering why my friends like you help me say yes. And, you know, <laughs> no. Well, I begged you to take it. Mm -hmm. And uh, more than that. You but, <laughs> but I, I remember uh, a few years ago, there was a poll of inner city African American youth published in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And it said, list things white. And on that list, and I'll never forget this, speaking standard English, mm -hmm. getting straight, straight A's in school, and visiting the Smithsonian Institute. Yeah. It's, it's Smithsonian it's Institution, thank right. you. The S Smithsonian Institution. I was shocked, Lonnie, because Going to the Smithsonian was like going to Mars for us, or I don't know, no, going to, to Fantasyland. Yeah, yeah. I loved the Smithsonian. I first went when I was 10, nine years old, and um, soon to turn 10. And it was just magic, better than Disneyland yeah. by far. Yeah. How do we change that? Do you think that's still true? Um, I think there are so many kids, so many African-American kids, who don't get a chance to engage culture. Um, in museums, in Kennedy centers, places like that. I think it's crucially important. And one of the things I'm trying to do as secretary is really focus on the District of Columbia schools and to think about what are the best things we could do at the Smithsonian to aid those schools. Because for me, like you, the Smithsonian was really special. For me, it was the reason, one of the reasons why I said yes to being secretary was because in the middle 1960s, I'm a 12 year old kid and I'm in love with the Civil War, like so many other kids, because it's the centennial of the Civil War. And we're driving from New Jersey to visit my mother's family in North Carolina. And we get near Richmond, there are all these signs for museums and battlefields, Museum of the Confederacy, and I want to stop. And my father always has this excuse, I got to go 20 more miles to get gas, right? right so yeah, yeah. he never stopped. So on the way back, I thought, OK, let me get a map out. I went to Esso and got a map out <laughs> and tried to plot 20 miles before we would get to a museum <laughs> so I could tell my father. And he basically didn't stop. But he did something unusual. He came into Washington, DC because we always went straight to New Jersey. He pulled in, drove to the Smithsonian, and said, here's the place you can go understand America and yourself without worrying about the color of your skin. Oh, wow. And I've never forgotten that that's what the Smithsonian meant to me. As a kid, it was a place of possibility. Uh -huh. It was a place of fairness. Uh -huh. um, it was a place that mattered. And so my hope is that I could make the Smithsonian that way for so many other kids. Oh, that's beautiful. What do we do with... Um what do we do with the story of um, um, the Confederacy? Be, you know, not every week, but um, almost every other week during our season of Finding Your Roots, I have to tell somebody your great great grandfather fought for the Confederacy, and not to make them feel guilty about it. You know, that it's, I don't think guilt's heritable, right? right? So it's right. not your fault, um, and we're all Americans. And we, but how do we deal with that period? What, What's your take on Confederate monuments, for example? You know, I've been called by more mayors to figure out should they take down monuments. So um, 
you know, when the mayor of New Orleans called me and I said, well, you know, if you take Mitch Landrieu, Mitch Landrieu um, who was really pretty impressive, you yeah. know. And he and took them he took them down. He took, well, he called me and I said, if you're going to take them down, then you need to put them in a place where people can see them. Right. So he put them in a warehouse so, he, so people could interpret them. My problem is that you don't want to destroy all these statues. You don't want to take them down. But what you want to do is I could live with Confederate statues if they also said they were traitors to the Union. <laughs> right. um, you know, if they also said that you lost the war, even though they won the peace. Mm -hmm. And so I feel very strongly that you've got to help people understand that those monuments are less about the Confederacy and more about white supremacy. Uh -huh. And what's interesting is that the same time so many of those monuments were built, mm -hmm. you know, that the... Uh, they were also the mascots for Indians. I mean, so there's this whole sense of sure. whiteness in the late 19th century that is reflected in these monuments, in the mascots using Indians. So that, to me, is the story, rather than just, you know, these are about Civil War soldiers. Oh, absolutely. No, those monuments were part of a conscious, concerted effort to, to roll back the narrative on Reconstruction right. because of the, it was a very important that Americans believed that Reconstruction had been a massive right, failure. Right. Look and at the birth of a nation, right? Look at birth of a nation. Birth of a nation, people think it's about slavery. It's not. It's no. about Reconstruction. Yep. And why? There were three states were majority black states, right. South Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And three more states were almost majority black states, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. And in the 1868 um, election, right. South Carolina elected a black secretary of state, a black treasurer. Mm -hmm. There was a majority in the House of Delegates. Right. And if these black, black people, essentially you're talking about the potential for a black republic within a republic. Mm -hmm. And they had to dismantle it. And I think, Lonnie, we've never talked about this, but I think that the fact that 80% of the eligible black men in 10 of the 11 Confederate states in the summer of 1867 actually registered to vote. Yep. And in 1868, they voted. Ulysses S. Grant won the presidency overwhelmingly in, in the um, Electoral College, mm -hmm. but he only won the popular vote by 300,000 right. votes. 500,000 black men right. from the Confederacy voted mm -hmm. for Ulysses S. That's Grant. Right. And I think this scared the bejesus out of white people, not only in the South, but in the North Absolutely. too. Too much black power. That's right. And I showed John Lewis his uh, great-great-grandfather's voter registration card from that first freedom mm -hmm. summer of 1867. And then he looked at me and I said, John, no one between your great-great-grandfather and you voted again in Alabama because the right to vote was taken away. And that was true. And he looked at me and put his head, his head yeah. fell, mm -hmm. hit the, the table, and he just wept mm -hmm. like a baby. That's why voting rights was um, important. So the construction of those monuments occurred in the 1890s and the, early, the first decade of the 20th century as part of this um, alteration yeah. of the narrative, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it was the worst time and black legislatures had been venal. Right. Um, you know, they were stupid. Corrupt. Corrupt. They wanted to pass miscegenation laws so they could rape white women. Mm -hmm. legal. I mean, it was horrible. So that puts those statues in... Yeah. in um, would you put them in dialogue with other statues? Absolutely. Like Kahindi Wiley's Absolutely. Um, new statue that's going on Monument Boulevard in Richmond. That's wild. I think that's really powerful. I think the, the problem with the statues are those things are so damn big and heavy. They're huge. It's hard you to get them in a museum, right, yeah. you know? But I think that's what you need, that kind of juxtaposition to make it work. Right. What are you hoping um, to accomplish? What are your, your initial goals? It w when you started with the National African American Museum, your goal was to create the African, right. raise half a billion dollars and get the thing built. What's your goal as, um, on, what's on your short list so far as secretary? Well, goal number one is that half of the 14 secretaries died in office, so goal number one is not to die in office. <laughs> uh, that's goal number one. Um, but We can all applaud. I think it's important to recognize that the Smithsonian is visited and venerated, but I'm not sure it's valued. I'm not sure it does the work that it can in terms of being transformative for a nation. If I believe that the Smithsonian is part of the glue that holds the country together, it means that the Smithsonian's got to um, do the work it's done. You know, I love the pandas and all that, but uh, <laughs> let me say it in the right way. I love the pandas. Right. <laughs> but I think that it's got to also help us think about 
climate change, help us grapple with issues of race, help us look at women and the issues that that unfolds for us. I think that the Smithsonian has such amazing expertise, but the other thing the Smithsonian has is the great convening power. Oh yeah, I can call anybody, anybody, right? And they will come and help us grapple with these issues. So I want the Smithsonian to be as much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday. Right. I think that's one. Number two, it really is, you know, 35 million people come to the Smithsonian. But that means millions will never get here. So then the question is, what's the virtual Smithsonian? Mm -hmm. I mean, not the virtual Museum of American History or virtual Air and Space. What's the virtual Smithsonian that really allows you to, to cut this expertise, not just in science, art, and history, but in identity, in democracy, um, in innovation, really thinking very differently about how we do that. And then I guess the other piece for me is really thinking about what does it mean to be a national museum in a transnational age, mm -hmm. right? What is the role of the Smithsonian internationally? Mm -hmm. You know, most of what we do is a lot of scientific research, a lot of ad hoc relations. But what is it for the Smithsonian to be a 21st century institution that has a global impact? Mm -hmm. So trying to grapple with these kind of things and then basically really wanting to, I guess the other thing I want to do is convey to the staff of the Smithsonian that you are good enough to lead the Smithsonian. Uh -huh. Because nobody from with inside has led the Smithsonian in 75 years. Uh -huh. And that sends a message to staff. Yeah. Um, and so what I want people is, much like I had to do at the museum, I want people to believe that that's possible. Yeah. I want them to believe that the Smithsonian is the place that they can live their careers and have the leadership, but most importantly, have the effect that is transformative. As I keep thinking about John O. Franklin, he used to always say to me, when people go through that museum, they have to be changed. Well, that's what I want people to go through the Smithsonian. What, um, did you cry? Oh, man. I mean, I'm like, a, I'm crying over Casablanca. So, um, <laughs> but I think that what happened is that I always have this ritual that when I used to do honest work as a historian or as a curator, when I would do an exhibition, I would walk through and say goodbye. Because once the public goes in, it's no longer yours. The public will take it in ways you couldn't anticipate. So I decided to say goodbye to the museum, um, and I walk through, and suddenly I'm thinking about the work of the staff, the generosity of people who gave collections, but I thought a lot about my father and grandfather, who were not here, who were both gone, and I thought that this is their story. And I cried all night, yeah. all night. I've been given the uh, sign that it's time to entertain questions from um, the audience. So, but before we do that, give it up for my friend, Ronnie. Thank you. You're the best, man. I love you, Ben. Now, do we, we have a card system? Yes, we're going to take a card. There's um, a colleague on the other side, and I'm right here. Do you want to tell us some of your questions? So I can't call on anyone from the audience. I've they've been given instructions. Sure you can. You're the boss. No. I was told that oh. to, this is Jane's house. See, you come over to Hutchins Center in my house. <laughs> One of, the one of the reasons where we're such good friends is that neither of us learned how to follow rules. Yeah, I know. You know? I was started to do it, but no, I, she kicked me out. She tough, that little English woman right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Corey, do I have any? They're coming. I'm being a good boy. You're better than I. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. You just gave me one card. <laughs> so Better we have more coming. Question. Okay. We have more coming. All right. Great. Um, all right. Let me ask you the first one as they collect more. Um, well, I, I want to ask you something before that, which is you worked so hard for so long to create the African American Museum. Was it uh, a difficult thing to decide to become secretary? I mean, did you, I know you had plans, well, now we've done it, yeah. it's 
spend three years, then we can do this, then we can do that. How tough was that decision? I think it was one of the hardest decisions of my career. I really didn't want to be secretary, right? I really wanted to basically talk about my book, spend a year at the museum, and then go teach. Um, yes, I we, really, we, we, we talked talk about, about it, and I yeah. had this real desire to, you know, to, to, to slow down and to enjoy life a little more, but, you know. What he's saying is that professors are lazy, they don't really work hard, you know. That's true. Kind well, of. you know, but, you know um, but what I realized was that, how do you say no to the Smithsonian? And part of what happened is that I refused to be in the, in the competition, but then when I got in, I wanted to win. Oh, and sure. so, you know, you of sort course. of put yourself in. So, so it is really the most amazing thing to me. Um, but I must admit, the greatest sacrifice is giving up the best office in Washington, which had the best views of the Washington Monument and everything, to an office that is uh, historic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that location for the African American Museum is bad. I'm telling it you. Is, it's bad. All right, first question. I visited for the first time in March and I was really excited to see Phyllis Wheatley. Um, what was the process in curating figures who are less known than other figures? And are there figures um, that you wish were added before the museum opened? People, you didn't have enough time or enough space to tell someone's story. I think the way we actually came to craft the exhibitions is we spent several years just interviewing people doing focus groups, scientific sampling, to understand what people knew and what they didn't know. Mm. And then we brought the best scholars from around the world to tell us what they thought. And then basically the curators and I sat down and said, all right, here are the big stories we want to tell, but we were not sure how we're going to tell them until we get the collections. So we really felt, because usually when you build a museum, you already have the collections. Mm -hmm. So this was like going on a cruise at the same time you're building a ship, right. right? And so it was really an iterative process. But I think that there, were, there was nothing that I felt we left out, mm -hmm. right? I think that there were artifacts I wish we had. But I think that we've really told the stories in ways that allowed us to look at Phyllis Wheatley and Harriet Tubman and others. I think that the good thing about an, a museum is it's going to evolve. Mm -hmm. And so, and especially now that I'm gone, they're going to do something really cool probably. Um, <laughs> and, but I think that you'll see more stories, more ways to understand um, this history as the museum evolves. How do you approach conflicts regarding the museum's history of acquiring sacred and cultural artifacts? Um, first of all, what I've made really clear to Congress and everybody is, if you don't, if you're afraid of conflict and controversy, then don't build this museum. There is no way you can tell this story without shining the light in all the dark corners, without collecting things that you might not traditionally collect. I mean, for example, just thinking about Emmett Till's casket. I, I think, candidly, we probably would have never done that at the Smithsonian, you know? But I thought that it was so important that we felt it was important to break the way the Smithsonian traditionally does things in order to tell certain stories. Uh -huh. And so that's why we did it. How was the collection built, and how many, if any, were already accessioned by other, um, or from other museums? One of the things I realized, being in and out of the Smithsonian for many years, that <laughs> if I took everything the Smithsonian had about African American history, it would be only 20% of what we needed. And most importantly, I didn't want everything black to be in one museum. Right. I thought it was really important that the Smithsonian's greatest strength is that it's got different portals into what it means to be an American. Right. So I want you to go through American history and see the way they talk about the Greensboro Lunch Counter or the way the Smithsonian Art Museum talks about the Harlem Renaissance. So there was or never any... black astronauts in, in the air, air and, and space right. museum. That's right, right. you know. Um, and so I think the notion was never take it all and therefore, if, they, if, if we were going to have to find 80% anyway, might as well just make it 100%, and that's what we did. And that goes back to the relationship between black authors in the African-American anthology or the American absolutely. anthology. Absolutely, right? absolutely. How do you tell the story? And, you have to, and the answer is, you have to do it both ways. Absolutely. You have to tell it as a self-contained narrative and tell it as an integrative narrative. Please tell the story of the airport shoeshine man. See, black people, I'm going to make a <laughs> horrible right. generalization, but black people raised to have the shoe shine. That's right. I got a lot of white friends that think sh shine your shoes is an act of God, you know, they're yeah, from no. the ring. That's right. But my mama would say, you cannot be on the stage with Lonnie Bunch That's and right. not have your That's shoe right. shine. That's right. 
When I went away to college, my father gave me a shoe shine box. There you go. Right? That was one of his gifts. So what I do is, like I said, I always shine my shoes before I get on an airplane. Right. Um, so I know every shoe you shine have your guy. Shoes shined. You have your shoes shined. Yes. Yes, that's right. right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, and so I sit down and I, do I the watch. Same thing. You know, and so I know every shoe shine guy in every airport in the car. I can tell you exactly where they are. And so I was coming back some from Dallas. Some Ethiopians, some, yeah, yeah. you know, like and, and Charlotte, they got Ethiopians. But, but, if you, but if you go to Dallas, it's these, you know, brothers from the South who've been, you know, yes. and so, um, so I'm getting Better my... Better shoeshine people in the South than in the North. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I nah, agree. So, you, know, you know, Boston, see? the shoeshine folks are not that good. Okay, no, I no, don't, no, you know, no, 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 uh, shaky. Uh, but, you know, Miami, oh, <laughs> baby. But anyway, so I get my shoe shined, and it's an elderly African-American guy, and he looks up and he says, are you that museum guy from Washington? That's pretty cool. And, and I said, yes. He doesn't say anything else, he, you know, nothing. So I'm thinking, oh, that's really powerful. Um, so he finishes shining my shoes and he gives me eight, and he gives me, he says it's $8. So I give him a $10 bill and he looks at me and he says, keep it for the museum. Oh, wow. Now, I gotta be honest, it's a shoe shine guy. Sure. So I said, come on, man, take this money. And he said to me, don't you dare be rude to me. He said, I'd not, I'm not sure what's in a museum, but if you do it right, it may be the only place where my grandchildren understand what life did to me and what I did to life. Yeah. And so that shoeshine guy was really my North Star. That, so building a museum, yes, we talked about Fred Douglas and you know, Martin Luther King, but the key is I always kept in mind that I wanted his grandchildren to understand the life of an average person who did everything they could to take care of their family and to make a country better. Oh, that's beautiful. That's great. Great story. Do you have any advice for a young African American entering the field of uh, museum curation, museum study? Get in another direction. No. Um, <laughs> I really think that the key is you've got to build your resume. So you've got to be comfortable moving around because you're not going to find the perfect job. And I think you want to build your resume. I think what you want to do is always make sure you've got the best education you can have. Um, and then put yourself in situations where you learn things. I think my success was not only tied that I understood history, but I understood systems. I thought about how, does things, how do things work? How do you work in a bureaucracy? How do you read blueprints so you could make determinations? So I've always felt that the key was to, yes, be a gifted scholar, learn your discipline, honor your discipline, but recognize that sometimes discipline alone is not going to get you to the promised land. No, right. Well, you couldn't be, you could be the most brilliant um, critic of Phyllis Wheatley's poetry, right. but that's not going to lead you to wake up in the middle of the night and think Amsterdam is going to plug the dike, right? <laughs> right. That's right. That's exactly right. No, you, um, you have to have a certain skill set. Yeah. You have to be a bit entrepreneur, yeah. a bureaucrat. It's an art to go to Congress and, yeah. and make the case. You know, it's a, a multi-skilled um, challenge well, to do you know, what you And did. again, I really think a lot of it for me is New Jersey. You learn to work the system. You right. work the <laughs> angles. Um, you know, you try to sort of, you never cross the line, but you get awful close to it. Sure. Um, and you do what you got to do to make it work. Does the um, National African American uh, Museum do the work of reconciliation? And do we need... Um, truth and reconciliation, and um, what's your take on reparations? Okie dokie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I really think that one of the goals of the museum was reconciliation and healing. Um, like many of us, I was shaped by what was going on in South Africa, and I kept thinking about that through the museum. We actually spent a lot of time bringing people in who could help us think about how do exhibitions help with reconciliation and healing? What are the kind of spaces we need to create that allow that to happen? How do you train the staff to be able to do that? So it was crucially important. And I think that for me, the museum, if it's done its job, illuminates the debt America owes to African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and that therefore, if it, that's the case, then one has to figure out how do you repay that debt? Mm -hmm. Um, and whether it is reparations, for me, it is about education. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the ways you pay that debt off? 
by ensuring that future generations have the opportunities that most of the early generations didn't have. Mm -hmm. You are invited to the rededication of the Shaw's 54th Memorial in the fall of 2020. Are you coming? <laughs> <laughs> I like these cards. Keep coming. Keep asking one kind of card. <laughs> I would I would do my best to be there, but you know I don't have any idea what my schedule is. <laughs> Good. See, he's learning all this That's stuff. Right. They give him a little manual of how to <laughs> answer these questions. What is your opinion of the New York Times 1619 project? And I'll add, since we all know that Africans had been here at least for before, a century right, before, before in what is now the United yeah. States. I mean, I think that... And I have to admit, I found it bizarre. that the, I, I wrote to Dean, right. who's a friend of mine, right. and mm -hmm. I go, you have to say that the, the Africans came to British North America, but right. they had been in the United States. Well, I think that's really it. The, the, the challenge is, on the one hand, it's because it was what it was, it started it stimulated a conversation. It's really important. But I thought that it was flawed in that it didn't say, as you put it, the Spanish America is very different earlier. Yeah. You know, and I think that what it really does is reinforce the notion of the kind of British or English bias. Right. As somebody that's written about California, you know, most of us were trained as historians to think of America going from east to west. Right. But if you're a California scholar, you're going from the south to the north. Yes. Um, and it changes the way you think about things. The fact that Los Angeles was established, founded, by 24 people of African descent or of mixed race, nobody ever talks about that. No. So I think that the New York Times is crucially important, but I wish it had a little more nuance. Well, and the first Underground Railroad actually ran That's right. from the British colonies to the to Spanish Spain. colonies. To if Florida. you crossed the St. Mary's River, you were free. That's right. And so, in St. Augustine, right. it was a black community, Fort Mose, which set up right outside yeah. mm -hmm. for freed black people who had come from um, the British colonies south uh, and crossed the St. Mary's River in, into Florida. First, the first slave revolt... 1526. Yeah. And that's why Jackson and others go into Florida to make it yes. an American quite state. You got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same when we, uh, you know, I used to root for the guys at the Alamo. You know, nobody talked about the fact that Texas wanted to secede from Mexico because slavery. Mexico had abolished slavery in yep. 1821. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the Texans wanted to keep slavery, obviously, because of cotton and the profitability. The, the, American, the, the history was so much more complicated. Yeah. Than, than we were taught. But I started rooting against the Alamo because, you know, those, those coonskin caps. I mean, that just, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. you got to lose with that. <laughs> How do you reckon, um, all right, well, let me, let me ask you this one, following up on that. How can or will you bring up social issues without alienating those um, with whom you disagree? Oh, that went a different day than I thought it was going to go. Um, how did you think it was going to go? Well, I mean, I thought it was, you know, how do you, how do, you do this in a political environment that we're in? Okay, um, answer both. All right, my notion is, <laughs> thanks. My, my notion is that you recognize that at a place like the Smithsonian, which is part of the federal government, the way you do that is by making sure you have allies in Congress. Right. Um, that to build angels that you have. So when I built the African American Museum, the first thing I did was find 30 angels from both sides of the aisle who could then speak in my favor because you'll never manage Congress, but all you need is a tie. That's all you need. So if enough people say that's okay, then you can do the work there. So it was Congress and then being able to sort of articulate a story through the media. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, so it was really building outside support to be able to do that work. And then recognizing that um, you're going to alienate people anyway, mm -hmm. but what you want to try to do is do it in a way that they understand the complexity of what you're trying to do. I would argue that the most difficult thing a museum can do, and maybe the most important thing a museum can do, is not teach history, but help the public embrace ambiguity. If you could help the public understand that there are no simple answers, mm -hmm. that it's the shades of gray, that it's nuanced and complex, boy, what a country we'd be. Mm. No, I think that's a, that's a good goal. Um, final question. Yeah. Um, then you have to buy those books, remember. And you'll, you'll sign all the books, right? Already did. Oh, you signed the books. Okay. Okay, final question. 
How do you reckon with the language of yesterday with words like quote unquote minority used for African Americans mm -hmm. and other people of color? How does such language affect the creation of new narratives? Well, I think, you know, you and I are of an age that we've seen the evolution from Negro to Afro-American to African-American. Hey, from hey. colored to yeah, Negro. Well, I wouldn't think, so you're older than me, you were I'm colored. Older. I'm yeah. older, I'm older, I'm older. I was never colored, okay, but you know. <laughs> but, hey, I wrote a book called Color. I know you did, yeah. you know. Um, but I think that part of what we want to do is because scholarship and understanding the public was so essential, it really helped us think about language. My curators talked a lot about what is the appropriate language to use. You know, do you use people of color? Do you use African American? We had long conversations about do you use words that were very derogatory but that were really historically accurate? Right. So we really wrestled with a lot of that. So just thinking about how do you communicate the past, how do you communicate difficult issues, what is the language you use was at the heart of what we had to do. Mm. So what did you decide? I mean, the, I remember I actually wrote a letter to Roy Wilkins yeah. mm -hmm. in 1969 saying you have to change the name of the National uh, Association for the Advancement of Colored People because mm -hmm. we're not colored anymore. Right. They basically threw it in the trash, you know, right. like little kids, you know, who cares? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, do, do you try to use the word that if Frederick Douglass called himself colored? Right. Would you we use the word color? We use we try to use the word that was appropriate at that moment. Right. And we try to then, you know, even the derogatory words, we do it in a, in a certain way. Right. But we make sure that we use those words. No. So, for example, little things, not little things, important things like candidly lynching. Mm -hmm. You know, there were long debates about should you show this? How many should you show? What are the ways to let people not have to see it? And my notion was you are going to, if you're going to this museum, you're going to see lynching. I don't care who you are. You may not see 30 images, right. but you'll see something because I think you can't understand that story without that. So, you know, while we've done it in ways that parents can sort of shield kids at the best, with little kids, but I felt it was crucially important that everybody had to go and see something like that to understand the story. Final question. Um, what are you going to do in the morning when you can't go by and see Emmett Till's casket? I, you know, um, I think that what I do is at least go by the museum and see that gleaming bronze building in the sun and recognizing that, as I said in the film, as long as there's an America, that museum will be there. Yeah. That gives me the sustenance to go on. What Lonnie Bunch III has done is nothing short of a miracle. And I cannot express uh, to you the depth of my admiration and appreciation for the miracle that you've accomplished. Give it up to Lonnie. <laughs>